thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So as I'm sharing my screen, I'm not going to be able to see the chat very well. So if you have questions that you want me to like answer at the end, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll check it once I'm kind of done. But also feel free to just unmute and stop me at any time if you have questions about what we're talking about in that moment. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. I can't share my screen. Oh, no. Okay, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> like I said, my favorite Olympic sport is half pipe snowboarding. Um, I had an opportunity to listen to Sean White speak a couple of years ago. And so I legit cried when he was like retiring this year. And I was seriously sitting like in tears after having heard him speak. All right. You should have access now, Sarah. Yes. Great. Awesome. There we go. Okay. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to be covering just some very basic kind of nutrition information today, talking both about the nutrition facts as well as the realistic application of those facts. Um, really quick, can everybody just give me like a thumbs up or a nod or something if you can hear me, see my screen, all of that. Okay, awesome. If at any point that changes, let me know. All right, to start with a little bit about me, um, lots of different pictures here. Um, I am currently getting a master's in public health nutrition at the University of Michigan. So like Victoria had mentioned, I am up here. I am at the university. I'm in grad school doing a lot of the same things you are in experiencing a lot of the same challenges in terms of eating healthy and making good decisions, especially, I know I'm on a tight budget as a graduate student, and so I know a lot of people are. Um, I got my undergraduate at the University of Arizona. Um, I did a dual program in nutrition and a program called Care, Health, and Society that was all about how do we take medical information and make it relevant for the public. So this is a great opportunity to kind of use that degree. Um, I worked after I graduated a couple of years in culinary. Um, I worked at a farm to school program where we grew everything on site and then took it into the cafeteria. And we, you know, we hosted like iron chef competitions for the kids. And so really got a chance to do some nutrition education there. And yes, they did have to put me on a step stool because I was too short to reach the pot. <laughs> um, after that, I moved and was working in nutrition education at an elementary school. And that's what those two pictures on the top right are. Um, we had a 5,000 square foot garden and the kids all went to PE, art, music, and garden. It was just a special in their week. Um, and we got to do cooking and nutrition education um, and, you know, everything from preschoolers where we're learning to eat the rainbow up to, um, you know, fifth and sixth graders where they're really getting into like recipes and learning about what they're eating. Um, also, I'm a very proud dog and cat mom. As you can see in that bottom corner, there is a chance that one or both of them will make an appearance during this presentation. So I apologize in advance if either of them decide to participate. And then the middle picture there is I did, I served a year with Food Corps, um, which is an amazing kind of branch of AmeriCorps. Um, we get some money from AmeriCorps, but we are solely focused on nutrition education in low income communities. And so really bringing that both to the students and to the parents. So today we are gonna to talk about my plate. If you grew up in the US, you've probably seen this a million times. Uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with it. And it is the USDA's require or recommendation for how to eat healthy. Talking about these five food groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, protein, and dairy talking about the proportions of them. You can see there that the vegetable portion is bigger than the fruit portion and all those kind of things. So this is what is considered the kind of the gold standard of how to eat healthy. I'm gonna tell you right now, my plate does not look like that every day. <laughs> it doesn't look like that at every meal and it doesn't look like that every day. I will tell you there are days that I don't get my dairy intake completely. There are days that maybe I have all vegetables and no fruit. And so it's really what we're going to talk about today is making my plate work for you. Um, you know, protein is a lot of times the most expensive component of this. You know, I can't afford to buy steak every day. I can't afford to buy chicken wings for every meal. And so we're really going to talk about some healthy options to achieve all of these food groups in a way that's realistic and in a way that's appetizing. I'm a huge believer that food tastes good. Food should taste good. Eating shouldn't be something you enjoy. It shouldn't be something that, oh, I guess I have to eat these five food groups every day. No, let's have some fun with it. Let's really learn how to make my plate work for you. 
Um, and at the end of this, we're going to have a little activity where you're going to have a plate, or we're going to have a chance to take my plate and really design your plate and what your plate's going to look like. Uh, any questions about kind of the my plate situation? I'm assuming everyone has some familiarity with this. If you don't, please feel free to stop me and I can go a little bit more into exactly what the my plate system is. Okay, awesome. Um, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go through kind of each of the food groups and talk about what some different options are to achieve those and why it's important to achieve those. Um, as we're going through, feel free to stop me. I'm gonna be really interactive here, asking you to come up with what are some fruits you like to eat? What are some different ways of getting fruit if you can't afford those options? So we're gonna talk about a lot of things. I really encourage you to be interactive, unmute yourself, talk to me. Um, and maybe Victoria, if you can help monitor the chat if people are participating that way, that would be great. I am on each of these slides as we go through the food groups, I do include the recommended quantity. I'm a huge believer that food is about quality and not quantity. It's not about, do I, did I eat you know, exactly two and a half cups of this every day? It's about balance and it's about making sure you have all of those food groups every day. Um, but I do think it's important to at least be aware of kind of what the USDA recommends as a healthy amount of each one. Um, and each one does have a range. I chose the age range that probably most of us are in and that's 19 to 30. Um, and then the range that's on each side is because it, the difference is male and female. There's only one food group that the recommendation is the exact same for male and female. And we'll get to that towards the end. Um, but that is why there's going to be a range on each slide. So we are going to start with, oh, sorry, I forgot. I included this too. This is a direct uh, screenshot from the USDA website talking about kind of, you know, again, their recommendations. For fruit, it's focus on whole fruits, vegetables, bury your veggies. For grains, it's make at least half of your grains whole grains, vary your protein routine, and move to low fat dairy products. And again, those are all great recommendations for someone that has unlimited time and income and all of that. So these are absolutely what we strive for. And you know, I'm, I absolutely recommend eating whole grains and eating a variety of vegetables. But I also wanna be realistic and understanding that if you're on a budget or you only have a certain amount of time, it's still okay. And you're still eating healthy as long as you're consuming all of these food groups in the best way that you can. So now we're gonna start with fruits. So the USDA recommends anywhere between one and a half and two and a half cups of fruit a day. So I would love to hear from you. What are your, some of your favorite fruits? What are some of the ways that you can think of that we can get fruit in our diets? Feel free to unmute, put it in the chat, however you want to interact. Sarah, it looks like we've got kiwi from McKenna and pink lady apples. Oh, I also really love peaches, Em. I've got to say, I really, really do love the peaches too. Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing I do want to mention as we go through these is I understand there are dietary restrictions, there are allergies. Um, I personally am allergic to apples. So please know that as we're going through this, we're going to talk about a lot of different options. So if you are vegetarian, if you are gluten-free, if you have food allergies, we are going to do everything we can to still make this presentation relevant for you. But feel free to stop and ask questions. If you have them as you go along, I will do my very best to answer them. Anything else in the chat so far? Um, apples and almond butter, which is very, very good. And then I put strawberries personally. I had some with my lunch today. Yes, absolutely. So those are all really great examples of whole fruits, which is what the USDA does encourage is eating those whole fruits, eating them, you know, raw or cooked, but fairly natural, not adding a lot of different things to them, not changing them a whole lot from the way they come out of the tree or out of the ground or out of the bush. So absolutely, whole fruits are a great way to go. Uh, but as you know, whole fruits are maybe not always available or sometimes they're really expensive. So can anybody think of other ways that you can get fruits other than the whole solid fruit that you like pick up off the farmer's market stand? Any ideas of other ways? 
We've got canned and frozen. Yes, absolutely. Those are both great ways of still getting your fruit, still getting all those nutrients. Someone said frozen is so good during the summer. Yes, absolutely. I love fruit smoothies and I will be the first to admit that I pull like the frozen blueberries out of the freezer all the time. <laughs> awesome. So I think you guys got most of them. Um, we're going to talk about, so yes, whole fruit. Absolutely. And that is, like I said, that's the way the USDA recommends that we get majority of our fruit intake, but lots of other options. Fruit juice is a huge one. And I do want to say, when you go to the grocery store, there are fruit juices and there are fruit juice cocktails. Are both of those great options? And by cocktails, I just mean like the bottle of juice that says fruit juice cocktail. You're not talking about alcohol here. They're called cocktails. Um, they're both better than not getting any fruit intake at all. Absolutely. When it says it's a fruit juice cocktail, that's going to mean there's a lot more sugar in there. Are you still getting the nutrients? Yes, absolutely. But you just need to be aware of how much sugar you're consuming if fruit juice cocktails are your primary source of fruit juice. We have whole fruits, frozen, and cans. You guys got almost all of those. Um, does anybody know what fruit brings to our diet? What kind of, what are the benefits of eating fruit every day? There's a couple answers to this one. So feel free to shout out or put in the chat. It's okay if it's a guess. We're all here to learn. Uh, we've got vitamin D, fiber, carbs is, uh, I think carbs is one of them, uh, like the sugar and fruit. And then I was also going to say vitamins. Yeah, absolutely. So vitamins and minerals are a huge factor in why fruit is so important. Um, citrus especially is very high in vitamin C, which is super good for you. Um, but any sort of fruit is going to have vitamins and nutrients. Um, the other huge factor, and absolutely, I heard carbs is absolutely true. Fruits are a great source of carbs um, and that those carbs are used for energy. And so that's really important. The other thing that I have not heard mentioned yet is fiber. Fruit is a huge source of fiber and fiber helps everything in your stomach and your intestines to work properly and helps everything to pass through very nicely. And it's a really important factor in how we absorb those vitamins and minerals. So does anybody have questions about fruit? I will say the same thing about canned fruit that I kind of said about fruit juice is a lot of times you can get canned fruit in water or canned fruit in syrup. Same thing, both are better than not having fruit at all, but the canned fruit and syrup is gonna have a much higher sugar content, which is just something you wanna keep in mind. All right, we will go ahead and go forward to vegetables. So vegetables, a lot larger quantity. The range for vegetables is two and a half to four cups a day. That seems like a lot of vegetables. Um, but like we just talked about, there are a lot of different ways to get those vegetables in our diet. So I'm going to ask the exact same question. What are some ways that we can get vegetables in our diet? What are some vegetables you like? I know this is a harder one for a lot of people. I worked with a preschooler at one point who I asked what his favorite vegetable was and he told me it was fruit. And I think that's fair. I think a lot of us like fruits more than vegetables, but both have some really, really important nutritional value for us. It looks like we've got in the chat, um, bell peppers, green beans, um, broccoli and carrots and soup. Celery, um, also really like celery and peanut butter. Love the ants on the log. Um, and then McKenna loves asparagus, uh, Brussels sprouts, mushrooms, onions, all of it. Oh my gosh, awesome. There's a lot of variety here today, which I love. And I heard a couple different things in there that we're gonna touch on as we go through all the different ways to get your vegetables. Um, so 
raw vegetables, salad, raw carrots, raw broccoli, all those things are great nutritional sources, are great ways to get your vitamins and minerals from vegetables, but certainly not the only way. I want to take a second and talk about potatoes. A lot of people don't consider potato to have any nutritional value. They consider potato to not really be a vegetable. Potato, when you dip them in grease and fry them, you do lose a lot of that nutritional value for sure. But even fried potatoes are still considered a vegetable when you look at the food groups. There are still nutrients. And so a lot of people will say like, oh, I didn't eat any vegetables today. I just had mashed potatoes. That's still a vegetable. Is it the vegetable that has the highest nutritional value? No, but it is still a vegetable and still something that you should be proud of yourself for eating. It counts as a vegetable, no matter what form it's in. Soup, I heard somebody say that, which is fantastic. I personally love vegetables in my soup. Stir fry, a lot of people like to add that into their noodles, into their pasta dishes, into rice. All those different options are great ways to do it. And that's where I do feel like the my plate kind of graphic makes it look like you have to have your vegetables separate from your fruit, separate from your grains. And I really want to encourage people to think about meal planning and combining. Think about you don't have to eat raw carrots three meals a day. Think about throwing some carrots in your stir fry. Think about doing some things like that so that honestly it's more enjoyable and you still get all those minerals and nutrients. And frozen. Frozen vegetables absolutely have value and are a great way, especially if you don't have regular access to a grocery store or things are out of season, lots of different options um, to get your vegetables. And very similar to fruits, vegetables are a huge source of fiber in our diet, which is really, really helpful both in um, the absorption of fruits and vegetables, but also in the absorption of everything else we're going to talk about today. And all sorts of different vitamins and minerals, and in general, pretty different vitamins and minerals than you're going to see in fruits. And that's why it's really important to have both in your diet. Um, I know it sounds like they have the exact same nutritional value, vitamins, minerals, and fiber, but it's such different quantities and such different kinds that it is really important that you find a balance of both. Anybody have questions so far? I will keep going. Then. All right. Next category is grains. In grains, they recommend between six and 10 ounces of grains a day. What are some, this is what's not quite as obvious as maybe fruits or vegetables. What are some different kinds of grains that you can think of? So far we have rice and bread, um, quinoa. Yeah, absolutely. Faro. Yes. Lots of faro love in the chat right now. Very nice, <laughs> great. I know for me, quinoa makes up a huge percentage of the grains I consume every day. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, so you guys, again, got most of them. This is awesome. So popcorn is one that we don't always talk about. Popcorn is a grain. And I, popcorn is my guilty homework snack. Absolutely. I will sit here and snack on popcorn as I work. And it is a great source of grain in our diet. Bread. Tortillas. Tortillas are another great one bagels, and rice, as well as everything you mentioned in the chat, quinoa, farro, all sorts of different options as well. Um, you know, English muffins, muffins, all those different things are grains. Um, the USDA does recommend that we really try to focus on whole grains. That means brown rice. That means whole grain bread, things like that. Um, again, at the end of the day, that is absolutely what you should be aiming for, is to consume at least half of your grains in whole grains. They do have more nutritional value, more fiber, lots of things like that. However, again, it's really important that we aim for eating a balanced diet, eating as healthy as we can while being realistic. 
I know one of the things Victoria and I had talked about is kind of the availability of whole grain products at the Maize and Blue Cupboard. And as much as we would love to have everything be whole grain, that's not always realistic. And it's more important that we're getting the nutrients and vitamins that come from grains, no matter what form they're in. So on that note, can anybody think of nutritional benefits for grains? There's a lot of them for this one and a lot of very different ones. All right, we've got carbs, carbs slash energy, fiber. Yes, absolutely. I know for me, the first thing that, that comes to mind when I see all this bread on the, on the screen is carbs. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So carbs, with the vast majority of our carbs in our diet do come from our grains. Uh, and that is our body's primary energy source. Absolutely. So you're right on with that. Um, grains also have a lot of fiber. They have a lot of nutrients, actually. Um, a lot of different things are found, um, especially in those whole grains, but in any form of grain. The other thing that's really important to note is that in the U.S. and in most countries at this point, most of our grain products are fortified. That means that a, a mineral or a vitamin that is not typically found in that product is added in while it's being processed. So hopefully all of us know that like, we don't harvest bread out of the ground. We harvest wheat and that is then turned into bread. And so in that process, things, especially like iron, um, are added in because of the fact that statistically so many Americans are iron deficient. Um, and we'll talk about uh, some other fortification as we move through the other food groups. Um, but a lot of our bread and our grain products are fortified with things like iron, and with other vitamins and minerals that just increase their nutritional value and help to counteract the fact that a lot of Americans and a lot of people around the world are deficient in certain vitamins and minerals. Does anybody have questions about that? I know fortification is kind of a weird one. Um, it is on the packaging if something is fortified. A lot of times it's in teeny tiny print on the back under the nutrition label, but it is there. Um, but that's why it's always helpful to, you know, start reading your nutrition label, start looking at things. And I know a lot of people look at the nutrition label and all they see is the calorie count. That's not what I'm talking about at all. It's about really learn what's in the products you're eating, really learn kind of what nutrients and what things are either naturally occurring or artificially fortified. Any questions about grains before we keep going? All right, awesome. So next one is protein. Protein, they recommend between five and seven ounces. And in most of these cases, the female recommendation is the smaller number and the male recommendation is the larger number. Uh, and like I said, we will get to one category where they're the exact same recommendation. But most of these are ranges. So I can tell you for this one, for women, it's five to six and for men, it's six to seven. So that's why I do include the whole range because there is some variability within that range or within those numbers as to exactly how much you should be eating. And again, I, I really like to emphasize quality over quantity. It's really about what you're eating, not how much you're eating within reason, obviously. So what are some options for protein? There are a lot of them here. I think this slide had more pictures than like the rest of the presentation combined. So what are some different options for protein? We have got, uh, I think I saw fish, um, beans, meat, rice and beans, tuna, chicken, eggs. Awesome. I think we got most of them. So nuts, absolutely. Steak, fish, including canned fish. And a lot of people don't think of canned fish when they think of protein, but it is an economical choice. If you know how to prepare it well, it can be really good. I honestly, I have canned tuna most of the time and I use it to make different things. Uh, 
And it really is just an economical, easy, shelf-stable way to keep protein in your diet. Beans, tofu, chicken, and eggs. And of course, pork and all those things as well that I just didn't have enough space for pictures for everything. But you're exactly right. Meat, fish, eggs, tofu, beans, nuts. There's so many different ways. And it goes so far beyond steak, which is what a lot of people think of. And so it's really important especially not only to get enough protein, but to vary your protein choices. I know there are people that eat chicken three meals a day. And yes, that's better than not eating protein at all, but you're really gonna get different benefits and different things from different sources of protein. And again, I really like to encourage people to food combine. It doesn't have to be you know, beans on this side of the plate and rice on this side of the plate and veggies over here make a stir fry, make a dish like that that has all the components in one. What are some of the benefits of protein? This is a trickier one for sure. Honestly, I just know you're supposed to have it, so I do it. That's totally fair. And I think there are a lot of people like that. Protein is one that we don't talk about the benefits as much. You're right. It's absolutely a eat your protein and eat your grains for energy. But there needs to be more explanation for protein. Absolutely. Does anybody want to guess? Anybody? We have in the chat helps build muscle question mark and satiety building muscle uh, enzymatic reactions. Absolutely. Those are great answers. So yeah, the primary function of protein in our body is building bone, building muscle, um, building skin. It's a fa uh, predominant factor in blood. It really is kind of the building block of most systems in our body. Uh, you're absolutely right that it does. Uh, it is a huge factor in enzymatic reactions and in a lot of those reactions in our body. Um, and that goes way far beyond what we're gonna talk about today, but you're absolutely right. Um, the other thing, protein is used for energy to a lesser extent than carbs and fats are, but protein is still a factor in energy. And a lot of times it's used when we don't have sufficient sources of the other couple um, things that can be used for energy. So absolutely, yeah. But the biggest thing is it is the building block of most things in our body. Any questions about protein before we keep going? I know one question I get a lot is kind of the conversation about does cooking protein change it? You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, sushi versus cooked fish and things like that. Protein is protein. And does cooking change the protein structure a little bit? Absolutely. But protein is protein no matter what form it's in. And it's all incredibly valuable for you to have. And please don't eat raw chicken or raw eggs. Just to be very clear, I'm talking about very specific proteins that can be eaten raw. <laughs> Feel the need to put that out there. <laughs> All right. And our last food group, dairy. Dairy, the recommendation is three cups. Doesn't matter if you're male, female, what age you are. Once you get past infancy, the recommendation is three cups. What are some sources of dairy? Yes. <laughs> Alyssa with ice cream. Yes. <laughs> Kelly's echoing ice cream as well. <laughs> we have cheese. Yeah, absolutely. Milk as well. Yes. Anything else? Yogurt as well. That one just came to my mind. Yes, absolutely. So some of the things that I have here, milk and any sort of milk byproduct. So cheese, cottage cheese, uh, yogurt, all those different things are considered dairy. Cheese, 
Ice cream. Yes, absolutely. It is dairy. Am I recommending that the only source of dairy in your diet is ice cream? Please no. And please don't ever do that. But it is still an absolutely, it is a good source of dairy. It still has a lot of the same benefits. But just like we talked about with fruit juice and with canned fruit, it has a lot higher sugar content and has a lot higher fat content. And so we just want to be really careful that we're finding a balanced diet throughout this. Almond milk, soy milk, hemp milk, coconut milk. I know there are some I'm forgetting. Um, all of the alternative milks, all the plant-based milks are considered dairy. Um, I heard somebody mention almond butter earlier. That is considered dairy. Anything that is kind of a milk supplement or a butter supplement, those are all, those all technically fall under the dairy category. And yogurt, like somebody mentioned. Um, so dairy is one of the ones that a lot of people find harder to consume, um, especially people who are lactose intolerant and people who maybe don't like milk. That's okay. There are lots of options. Um, first thing, like, obviously any sort of alternative milk that your body can tolerate and that you enjoy. Absolutely a great option. Um, the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is a lot of lactose intolerant individuals can have yogurt. It has to do with the way that yogurt is fermented and things like that. So I, I'm not advocating for like, just go out and try yogurt if you're lactose intolerant, but do some research, find out there are brands that I know people who are lactose intolerant, but can handle dairy because of the way that it comes to be yogurt. Um, so lots of different options. Um, dairy is a more controversial one. A lot of people feel like it could just be grouped into protein. A lot of people feel like it needs to be its own thing. So keep your eyes out over the next few years. I wouldn't be surprised if the MyPlate recommendation changes in with time. But for right now, we are considering dairy to be an important part of a healthy diet. Can somebody tell me why? What are some of the things that dairy provides for us? We've got calcium equals bone health. Yes, absolutely. Vitamin D. That is D. a big one. Yep. Awesome. Those are the two big ones for sure. So calcium, super important in bones and teeth. Um, calcium is essential for building bone, building teeth, as well as maintaining bones and teeth. So it's really important that we have an adequate source of that. Um, cause somebody mentioned earlier, all sorts of reactions in the body also utilize calcium. Um, and a lot of dairy is fortified, just like we talked about with grains. Um, I forgot to mention it, but a lot of eggs are fortified, um, as a protein source. And to see a lot of dairy fortified with vitamin D with iron, things like that to again, help counteract the fact that a lot of Americans and a lot of people around the world have deficiencies in those vitamins and minerals. Sarah, we've got a question in the chat. Do alternative milks provide calcium? Not as much, but yes. And a lot of times it is through artificial fortification. Um, so it's not going to be quite as much calcium per serving. Um, again, depending on the brand, there are some brands that will put right on there. Like we have just as much calcium as milk. Awesome. Um, but a lot of it does come through artificial fortification, which there is nothing wrong. I know a lot of people hear artificial and think like that's bad for you. Fortification is not a bad thing. It can be really beneficial, especially for people who can't consume as much calcium via dairy uh, as is recommended. Awesome question. Anybody else? All right, then we are gonna take a couple minutes and I'd like to give everybody, we'll do like four or five minutes to kind of design your plate. Think about, I always encourage people to think about like a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner that maybe incorporates all these things or maybe like, I personally don't like vegetables with my breakfast. I just don't, I'll eat fruit with breakfast but I'm not a huge fan of vegetables with my breakfast. But so then think about ways that maybe a later meal can have more vegetables and less fruit. Kind of think about that balance throughout the day. Not every single meal has to have all five components uh, as long as you're getting them throughout the day. And so take a couple minutes, 
If you're artistic, feel free to draw. If you wanna just kind of jot it out on a piece of paper, that's fine. Um, feel free to just open a Word document and type in that if you don't have paper. Uh, but just think about what your plate would look like. And we'll come back in a few minutes and people can share some different things and ask questions you might come up with. Feel free to unmute and ask questions during this time too, if you want. I'm gonna mute myself just so you don't hear all the background noise. All right, we're going to take like two or three more minutes to work on this. I just want to encourage people to be realistic. Uh, you know, as much as you like, I know that when I'm packing lunch for myself, I'm not going to, you know, have steak and potatoes for lunch every day. Um, so really try to be realistic, think financially, think logistically, and also be creative. You know, I've, I've done workshops similar to this before. And some of the ways people come up with getting all these food groups is really impressive. So feel free to be creative with this. I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody thinks.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can actually see all of you. Um, I would love to hear what some people were designing for your plate. And if you want to put it in the chat, if you're more comfortable that way, that's totally okay too. Um, but we'd just love to hear kind of what some people are thinking. I would love to um, kind of get started and just kind of get the combo flowing. Um, and a lot of what I wrote down, I had to get kind of creative. So I'm not going to go out and drink a glass of milk, but I do put milk in my lattes that I make every morning. And, and kind of thinking, it got me thinking a little bit further of, of just um, <laughs> talking about how things don't have to be exactly portioned out in a beautiful plate, like you were saying. Like I never would have even considered that my dairy free milk and my coffee that every morning, you know, was counting towards what I'm working towards and my dairy goal every day. So yeah, it was, it was interesting to see that. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, absolutely. And that's adding things to your coffee, adding, you know, having milk with your cereal that still counts. Absolutely. There are a lot of great ways to do that. Thanks for sharing. Um, and I saw McKenna put in the chat. Oh, that looks awesome. Yeah, I agree. We're all eating at McKenna's tonight. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, that looks fantastic. And I love the apples, peanut butter, and chocolate chips for dessert. Absolutely. Oh, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Adding milk to your coffee. Uh, you know, the other thing that a lot of people don't think about is like, I, I use stir fries as an example all the time because it's a great way to combine foods. Put some lime juice in it. You know, is lime juice in your stir fry going to be enough to like meet your fruit goals for the day? No, but a little bit is better than nothing. And it gets you moving towards that goal. It's really interesting to think how things that you would just kind of already add, like I, like when you said lime juice, I already put lime juice on my street tacos, you know, but, but then to actually think about how that's playing a role is very interesting. Alyssa, I saw you unmute for a second. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, <clears throat> I'm generally not very good at making a plate for breakfast. It's usually like, okay, what's on the counter? Let me shove that in my bag and go from there. Um, and so I was thinking about ways that I could make things ahead. And I'm real into, maybe this is like, I'm an 84 year old stuck in a 27 year old's body, but I'm really into quiche. <laughs> Okay. And awesome. you can make those ahead in like a muffin tin. And I was thinking, Sarah, when you said that you don't like having vegetables for breakfast, like my exception, I'm generally that way as well. The exception to that rule is like omelets. And so I was thinking about that and that could be tasty and get some, cause I generally find that I get to the middle of the day and I'm like, huh, we have knocked out our grain and dairy. Now I need to have a plate full of vegetables. So maybe that could help me have some vegetables and protein earlier on in the day rather than relying on it at every, at the last two meals of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good point. And I know the next talk I'm doing is on meal prep and meal planning. So we'll definitely talk about a lot of that then, but you're absolutely right. And I know that I'm the same way about lunch. Like I'm, I'm okay at like getting up and getting breakfast in the morning, but like the idea of prepping a whole lunch for myself first thing in the morning, it needs to be prepped the night before or it's not happening. And so, yeah, absolutely making those choices and looking at ways to get those balanced meals that can be prepped ahead of time. And that's where, you know, going back to frozen foods and canned foods can really have benefit in that sense. Um, yeah, and I absolutely agree that sometimes with like omelets and quiches and things like that, yeah, you can get some of those vegetables in there for sure. Um, I know one of my favorite things currently is a caprese omelet. So you like the tomatoes and the mozzarella and the basil in the omelet. And you get, you get dairy, you get vegetables, you get protein. So yeah, absolutely. Finding ways to combine those and to prep ahead is huge. Absolutely. Yes, there's the time and date for the next meal prep conversation. Oh, awesome. Yeah, avocado toast with some sort of egg is a great way to get a lot of those different food groups in there. Anybody else want to share anything or have questions 
Um, I'm happy to answer questions about nutrition, about meal prep, about the program I'm in, about nutrition education I did, gardening. I'm here. Ask me whatever. <laughs> I'm curious about the um, the logic behind sorry, wow, words are hard and it's only Monday. <laughs> um, the logic behind different amounts of foods for different genders um, and like what the impact is of, of framing things like that. I was, I guess I was kind of shocked that dairy was the one that was the same because I was thinking that like women's bone health is technically an issue. And so I, I assumed that that wouldn't be the one that it was the same. Yeah, no, I absolutely get that. And there, there is so much science behind all of that. And it is something that it's continually updated. Um, and so we have seen it change over the years. We've seen some different things, you know, for a while. I don't know, like, I mean, this is probably dating myself, but I was, when I was very young, like dessert was on the my plate. Dessert was something that was included. Um, and I do, so that I was, remember that. And I was like, we're missing something here. As, and so they have taken dessert out of the my plate equation. Sorry, cat. Um, um, and you know, I have very mixed feelings about that personally. I'm a huge believer that we should be able to treat ourselves. That being said, if we're truly using my plate as a model for every meal, you don't need dessert with every meal. So I, I think there should be like a my plate and then a like, you know, my daily plate. Okay, like, yeah, have dessert with dinner, absolutely. But you don't need necessarily dessert with breakfast, lunch, and dinner most days. Some days you do, and that's okay. <laughs> I will be the first to admit I have done that at times. So it's really all about that balance. So it is something that is continually updated. Um, and yeah, a lot of the science behind the differences in genders and the similarities in genders um, has to do with life stage. And so as you do get into older females, there's a difference and older males, there is, there does become a difference as you get into like that osteoporosis risk range and things like that. Um, but looking at our, kind of, again, I say our age range, I pick 19 to 30. I figure that's going to probably encompass most of us. Um, that is where it's considered to be, you pretty much need the same amount across genders. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. As you get older, a lot of that calcium need and things like that can vary between genders. Um, and same thing, like, you know, iron, changes tremendously when females go through puberty. There's a different iron need at that point in time. And so these are things that like, yes, speaking very generally, um, speaking very generally, um, you know, these age ranges encompass a lot. Um, and that's what, like, I can't stand the five to 18. That's a huge age range and there's a whole lot that happens in there. And so I do think, yeah, the my plate numbers and the my plate system is speaking very generally about very large populations. And I'm glad somebody else remembers the dessert thing because that was definitely growing up, that was a thing. I remember they'd come to our class and like give presentations and people would be like, which one are you good at? And I would be like, that one. I got that one on <laughs> block. We are good. Yeah. Let um, me tell you all the ways you can make dessert. Yes, absolutely. And I do like to include dessert as a way to get some of those other components in too. Whipped cream is a dairy product. <laughs> Ice cream, like we talked about, is a dairy product. You know, I love a good fruit tart. Like I love the desserts with fruit on them. Um, I make really good avocado brownies. Um, lots of different ways to be creative. Um, and that's why I do struggle with that. They don't even consider dessert to be a food group at this point. Because there's a lot of ways to food combine and get those food groups through dessert. And again, sometimes you just need chocolate and that's okay too. I don't, I, I do not use terms like good food, bad food, like foods to avoid. There are foods to limit, but um, again, unless you're allergic, unless there's anything like that, I don't feel like there are any foods that you're never, ever allowed to eat. Again, there are foods to limit there are foods that are better for you, but I don't believe in there being bad foods. Unless you're allergic again, <laughs> just saying. And that's where it does get also really tricky. Like I said, I'm allergic to apples. So does that make apples a bad food? No, but it makes it bad for me. 
And so that's why I can't stand the terms like good food, bad food and things like that. Um, because I think it's, it's so individual. There's dietary preferences, there's moral and ethical, there's religious implications to what we eat. And it's really important that we don't discredit the diet of certain individuals because of those concepts. We've only got like four more minutes. Does anybody want to ask me anything else or talk about anything else? Share a story. I think food is so personal. Alrighty, if no one has any more questions, we will go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you, Sarah, so much for your wonderful presentation. And thank you all for being here and being so engaged. Um, I, there will be a recording of this session. So if you registered um, online, you'll get a recording. Um, and yeah, once again, thank you, Sarah, so much for being here. If you want to put your email information in the chat, just in case anyone wants to reach out to you. Um, that would be great. And if not, everyone else have a great evening.